Hi everybody, I'm Holly Kovo from Fitting Fitness In, and welcome to Get Healthy with Holly. Today I have with me Ryan Glatt. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you for Thanks having for me. Thanks for joining me. Yes. Um, Ryan is a, a brain health coach at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute Brain Health Center, and um, with a strong background in exercise science and human health, he develops curricula that specifically targeted towards those with dementia, Parkinson's disease, autism spectrum disorder, and traumatic brain injury. Basically coaching individuals towards optimal brain health. And as well as developing those programs for the health and fitness industry on health neuroscience, Ryan actively consults with for brain, brain-based technology companies, sorry, um, like SmartFit. He's completed brain health programs for the Amen Clinics, the Neuro Coaching Institute, the Neuroscience Academy, the Neuro Leadership Institute, Neuroscience for Coaches, and other topics of brain health. And um, Ryan developed the Brain Health Trainer Certification course that I took and passed last summer uh, for the Functional Aging Institute. And let me tell you, it was a tough course. It was very interesting, uh, but it was very tough. But I'm happy to have gotten certified, and I make use of all of that information all the time in my classes. And my clients. We're proud of you. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about how exercise affects your brain, and I'm going to turn it over to Ryan to add some slides to it, um, and we can talk a little bit about that. Absolutely, great, Holly. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, many people have heard that exercise is good for the brain. Uh, which is amazing, right? That This is uh, not, it, it's a recent discovery in the past two decades, I'd say. Um, and we've all known that exercising makes you feel better and probably has a lot to do with health in general, especially mm -hmm. in health. But lately in the media, um, there's been a lot of, you know, coverage on, on brain health and exercise. But I feel it's helpful to contextualize that at different levels. And, and what are the different ways it affects your brain? Because usually people fixate on what's called a single mechanism. Oh, it's the growth of new neurons. Oh, it's this one chemical, and that's how it does it. But it's actually more complicated than that. So what I want to do is share some slides to uh, illustrate the different levels in which exercise can impact the brain. And it's still theoretical, right? Um, for example, there's this process called neuroplasticity, your brain's ability to change. And this is sort of the fundamental theory behind the ability for exercising and other things to change your brain. Now, this is well with you into late adulthood. So regardless of how old you are, no matter what condition you have, you have this ability. But as we age, it just requires more effort to make a change. So there's a couple different types of neuroplasticity. There's structural plasticity in which the actual neurons or the individual brain cells in your brains are changing. Hopefully you're gaining over losing, but it's normal to, to lose brain cells on a daily basis. Uh, especially as we age, but it's also very possible and factual that we gain neurons, especially with healthy things like exercise. But then there's functional neuroplasticity, which is the change in brain activity uh, and the adaptations of that. So we have things called synapses, which is where neurons talk to each other. And these synapses can actually get stronger with repetition and practice, but they can get weaker when you're not using them. So this is where you hear the use it or lose it hypothesis. And while it's overly simplistic, it's helpful to think about. So we have functional neuroplasticity and structural neuroplasticity. And then there's uh, different metabolic factors. This is really important because I feel that so much of the population has issues with cardiovascular health. And that means they probably have issues with brain health. The good thing is that interventions that probably help cardiovascular health anything from, from 
blood pressure medication to, I don't know, say exercise, right? That helps blood pressure management, that helps healthy blood flow are also going to help the brain. So this is a picture showing that people with hypertension, people with high blood pressure have reduced brain blood flow. But if we exercise or we manage or even get rid of hypertension, we can increase all these factors and hormones, proteins, and chemicals that actually grow the brain in certain ways and also grow the structure and the function of blood vessels and increase their distribution throughout the brain. So this is really important because blood flow can really help a lot of different aspects of brain health. But it's not only blood flow, it's also learning. And we'll talk about that. But generally speaking, when we exercise, we create these new brain cells, that neurogenesis process. We therefore improve our memory. There's this molecule called BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic factor that gets released. And this has been titled Miracle Grow for the Brain by Dr. John Rady, who wrote the book Spark, which is all about this concept. And when we have that increase in BDNF, that can lead to what's called a larger hippocampus, which is an area deep in the brain. It's kind of shaped uh, like a seahorse and it's responsible for learning and memory. And research shows that when you exercise more, it increases in size or you delay its shrinkage that can be associated with abnormal or even normal aging. And if we can exercise and get more blood flow, increase the size or function of this hippocampus, that is very attractive. So if I told you there's a pill that you could take that allows you to increase the size of your brain structure related from memory, and that was exercise, right? At first you're like, well, what is that pill? Give it to me, I'll do anything. But it's exercise, it's been there, right? And this is great, but I do feel that in the media, a lot of people are just perpetuating cardiovascular exercise because that's where most of the research has been done. But that has a lot to do with the simplicity of studying aerobic exercise in the research, as well as a lot of people reporting on this, not understanding how variable and how rich exercise really is. And so there's a lot of different types of ways of experiencing exercise, right? I love this slide. I absolutely love it. It's a complicated one. And it's, it's still, uh, it's not perfect. It's not entirely scientifically sound. But the reason I created this slide is because you have different parts of your brain that do different things, right? They're likely going to be stimulated by a variety of things. So if we put our hand in the back of our brain, that's our occipital lobe. And that is responsible for vision primarily. So if we do things that incorporate visual tasks, let's say a ball coming at us like tennis, pickleball, ping pong, softball, baseball, anything of that sort, even badminton, it's likely that that is going to help that region, right? It doesn't mean that you do it once and then boom, it grows like that. It's not like that at all. But there has been research taking masters athletes, people who are 60 plus who are doing athletic activities and they compare them to sedentary older adults. And the masters athletes have a higher volume of this occipital lobe. Now, why is that? That could be for a lot of reasons. It just could be because they're more fit and their overall brain volume is not as uh, shrunk or, or doesn't lose as much volume as someone who's sedentary. But it also could be that maybe they're doing things visually, right? And, and some of that's theoretical, but I think it's helpful to think, okay, if I do things that are visually challenging, or if I look towards that cerebellum, that coordinative exercise, mm -hmm. that's helpful for coordinating movement, right? Or the temporal lobes, that's, that's where that hippocampus lives. Maybe I need some aerobic activity as well. If we look at the parietal lobe up top, up top and towards the back, we have sensory rich activities. And or the frontal lobe, I do things that are more cognitively demanding, things like boxing, resistance training, martial arts, mind body exercise. So this isn't to be something that's meant to be overwhelming, it can be, but it's to give the idea, the thought process that a lot of variety of different types of exercise is good for the brain. So it's kind of like nutrition where people say a variety is good. Right. But if I said food is good for you, you'd be like, what are you talking about? Right. <laughs> be more specific. But we do that with exercise. We say exercise is good for the brain. Done. Right? <laughs> Why do we do that? Right. And I feel like this conversation is missing. Um, whereas with nutrition, we get macronutrients, micronutrients, calories, frequency, timing, you know, all these specifics. But with exercise, 
we just say, oh, exercise. And, and what most people do is they hear this and then they start walking and then they think that's enough. Right. It's true that research shows that people who walk versus people who don't have better brain health, have larger hippocampal volumes. But I think we really care about our brains and therefore we should probably do more. Even if it's not perfectly evidence-based, let's not take chances. Let's have a nice variable exercise program. So let's get into how we actually do that. For right. sake, we can have three different types of exercise, cardiovascular exercise, resistance training exercise, and skill-based exercise. And we're going to give examples of each of these. Now, I know it says two to three days a week for each of them. Those are general guidelines. I know there's not nine days in the week. Last time I checked, right? And yes, you could do two days a week of each. That's one way of doing it. But there's a lot of ways to skin this cat. Not that I endorse skinning cats. But cardiovascular exercise is really just about getting your heart rate up. There's a lot of ways to do that. Resistance training is just about lifting an external load, creating some tension in your muscle. There's a lot of ways to do that too. Skill-based, this is the one people often don't talk about. It's combining that learning a new skill with the exercise or the movement. So we know that learning a new skill is good for the brain. We've, we've probably heard that before, but we don't, we don't talk about it in the combination of exercise. So skill learning can be a lot of a sport, a leisure time activity, a, a martial art, a dance, a mind body exercise. And Tai Chi might be low intensity and dance might be higher intensity, but both are very good for the brain according to research. So here's some different ideas for cardiovascular exercise. We could go walking, which many people are walking, but when I talk to people who are on walking programs, I often find there's an opportunity to maybe walk briskly or a little bit more challenging. More right? productive, that's what I tell them. It needs to be a productive walk. And some people are afraid of falling, which I understand. Yeah. People want to increase risk of, of injury or falls. But also, if you're walking faster, you do have to pay more attention, right? So maybe uh, it's a bittersweet uh, prescription here, but maybe that could be beneficial for us. In addition, we have circuit training, body weight exercise, very common, virtually or in person nowadays, things like swimming. And then, of course, on the bottom, we have exercise machines. I know right now with COVID-19, it's quite difficult to access these, but I'm very surprised to know how many people have some sort of exercise machine, whether it be an elliptical treadmill or ergonomic bike in their home, right. is now a overqualified clothes hanger. Um, and most people I talk to are on walking programs and actually have an aerobic exercise uh, machine in their home and haven't used it in a decade, right? And so when we contextualize that, hey, maybe that higher intensity is good for you, that variability might be good for you, the clothes hopefully start, start to come off, not of you, but of the machine, right. and that could be utilized. And I found that a lot of that is they just don't know how to use the machine. So I, I go into people's homes to work with them. So I'll That's work amazing. with what they yes. have and teach them how to use that machine. Or, or know what to do on it or why to exactly. do it. Why am I using it, right? But when we look at that, that chart with the brain blood flow, well, that's pretty motivating. Yep. And you can probably think, oh, I, maybe I'm not getting out of breath on my walks. And if I had to really get out of breath, I'd, I'd feel unsafe doing that with my balance, but I can do that on my bike. So if I get on my bike and I get really out of breath, maybe to the extent where I can have a broken conversation, I say, hi, Holly, how are you, right? And I'm out of breath like that. I can do that safely on my bike, right? Exactly. We know if we need to do that for brain health, we're probably more motivated to do so. And yes, the adjusting of the, the ergonomics of it, the, the settings, uh, but it is not rocket science, right? <laughs> so, no, but some of them do get to be, look very complicated. You know, the more oh, they, can be very they are, the more the, the, the active agers are a little more intimidated by it. So. Yes, but sometimes just learning by figuring it out is helpful too, right? Yeah. And so uh, that, that in itself is skill learning at least at the initial stages. Now for resistance training, this is a little bit more foreign to some, and it shouldn't be because it is so important for brain health as research is showing. We have things like bands, elastic bands, we have exercise machines, we have dumbbells, um, and we could even get more creative like loading backpacks, heavier water bottles, things of that regard. Mm -hmm. On the bottom, we have more functional training activities, things like medicine balls, kettlebells, barbells, and most individuals would not 
do these on their own without proper instruction from a physical therapist or a personal trainer, which I highly recommend. But once you have uh, established a fundamental understanding of these tools, they can be immensely valuable for various aspects of health. But what I love about those is you're also learning a new skill and how to use them, which could be beneficial for brain health. So resistance training has been sort of perpetuated as this meathead activity that college football players do, and they're not very smart. But actually, research is really showing, especially for older, older adults, how important this is, and especially for mediating things that have been related to brain health, like osteoporosis and sarcopenia and loss of power and loss of balance and gait speed. Right. All of those things, if you have a reduction in those or those are there, it's likely they're correlated with a brain health-related risk factor. And so controlling for those is important. Hormonal health. So I can't talk enough about how important resistance training is and how beneficial it could be. Well, the other thing, too, is that you gain more muscle when you're doing resistance training, which helps increase your metabolism. And since your metabolism slows down as you get older because you're less active and have less muscle, then the more that you increase your muscle, the faster your metabolism, the less weight that you're going to gain as well. Absolutely. And, and uh, abdominal fat has been correlated with neuroinflammation. So it's this huge bi-directional cycle. There's so many mechanisms at play. Blood flow, learning, functional brain activity, regional brain changes, right? But the important thing is most people are not doing it and we should be doing it for many, many the last category, but certainly not least, is skill-based modalities. Now, I want to say that if you're learning anything new, it is a skill. So if you're learning one of the resistance training modalities we mentioned, that is skill-based, okay? And that may uh, qualify you for checking off that category for now until you learn it, of course, and you become efficient, in which case you might want to introduce new skills. But the mind-body exercise category is a popular and very beneficial one especially those who want to be more careful about their, their joints or their neuromuscular system and those that want to reduce stress, improve sleep. Of course, exercise can do that very well, but mind-body exercise is very unique and valuable. And so within that category, we have Tai Chi, Pilates, yoga, and these can be in a chair, they can be standing. Um, these can be very powerful modalities. I, I really enjoy these ones. And they, they really require your focus. They're not super intense, but research has shown in certain populations, it does improve aspects of brain health. And then on the bottom, we have more uh, metabolically demanding skill-based activities, things that get your heart rate up, but you still have to pay attention. So much so that if you did not pay attention, you might fail or get hurt. So if you're in a boxing class and you're not paying attention, you're punching over here. Hopefully you're not sparring with anyone. Or maybe a more realistic example is if you're playing tennis and you're not paying attention, how do you respond to the ball? How do you not get hit in the face? How do you not let it go by you, right? So these really require your, your cognitive resources to a degree. And so think racket sports, stick sports, dance, boxing, and other martial arts, these are all examples. And what I love is that so many of the modalities we've talked about are avail available online. So yes, it's challenging to do them when you were doing them uh, in, in real life and now you're in, you're in the home or you were never doing them before. But what I've seen is that a lot of the people I work with are more active in a variety of ways than ever before because of what's available now. Right. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, um, I know we're, we're closing in on time here, but we'll talk a little bit more about the exercise prescription aspect of this. And so, you know, we've talked about the three different types of exercise, cardiovascular, resistance, and skill. And we've talked about some of the different types. And so looking at this more like a menu than a checklist is helpful. And maybe looking at which of these categories of exercise are you not doing? And maybe picking one and starting there is a great strategy. Generally speaking, we want people to do at least 150 minutes of exercise per week. That's kind of a weird number. It's a weird way to think about it. It's like how many minutes of TV do you watch per week? Nobody talks about that. Mm -hmm. But really that is equivalent to five days a week of 30 minutes or three or four days a week of 60 minutes. And, you know, it doesn't have to be at 150. The more, the better. About if you can get to 300 minutes, you can double that. There's additional benefits. There's also additional benefits for having a lot of different types of ex exercise. Now, high intensity isn't always the best, but what I find is, most people I talk with need a little bit more intensity, including myself. 
So we use this 10 out of 10 scale, 10 being the most intense, one being the least intense. We call that RPE or rate of perceived exer exertion, as you know. And so six, out of, six to eight out of 10 is moderate to vigorous, whereas one is nothing at all, very leisurely, probably sitting down or walking very slowly. The frequency is up to you based on your availability, how busy you are, how much you want to commit. Three to five days a week is generally recommended. Try to mix it up. More research is coming out that for cognition, especially in older adults, and if you've had some, some memory complaint, you've noticed your cognitions change, it, you might benefit from shorter and more frequent exercise sessions. And this makes sense, kind of getting your daily dose of, of brain blood flow, right? That, that might make sense. It could be keeping your neurotransmitters healthy. It could be that as you age, those neurological structures are more sensitive and prolonged exercise might create more metabolic stress. Who knows? But you might want to opt in for five days a week of 30 minutes over two days a week of 90 minutes each, right? That, that may not be as sound. Yeah, and 90 minutes is a, lot of time, is a long time for for yeah, it doesn't mean that's bad, especially if it's a lower intensity, long walks, hikes, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But we want people thinking they need to be in the gym for 90 minutes. Right. Then 20 to 60 minutes per session is generally recommended. And, you know, what if, what if you're just starting out? Can you do five? Can you do 10? There's no wrong answer here. Whatever gets you to the ultimate goal. But as a general guideline, 20 to 60 minutes is, is probably most beneficial for brain health. So when I run my classes, they're 60-minute classes, and I have level one and level two. We start off with a warm-up, and then we do a cardiovascular exercise, which is routines that they have to memorize and learn. Right. And I switch it up on them all the time. Just when they've got it down, I change it on them. And, and then that's after super important. That, yeah. Exactly. And then after that, we do a riddle section where I'm challenging their brains. And let me tell you how much better they do when I do the riddles after the cardio versus before the cardio. That's right. And then we do strength your training. Cardio, your cardio is actually a little bit more cognitively demanding than something like an exercise bike while watching the news. Exactly. Yes. So you've actually well, cognified step aerobics perhaps a little bit to put it bluntly, but that's great. And you've kind of warmed up those those well i i'm trained from the best you know <laughs> yeah there you go so that's great and i think you know, most people i talk to they have been doing the same routine for the last five to ten years now that's a good thing because of consistency but you might be lacking novelty and it could be you, you may say oh well i hit all these components already i've been doing that for the past few years i do resistance and then i do my cardio and then I, and that's great, but maybe it's not the modality you need to borrow from. Maybe it's some of those variables below, maybe intensity or even novelty. Maybe you need to switch it up because right. remember, novel skill learning is very beneficial for brain health. Now it shouldn't be to the extent where you're learning something new or trying a new modality every single week with it. It should not be burdensome and it should not be stressful. Otherwise it might counteract those effects. And so what we're looking to do is do something that's sort of in the middle. You don't want it too easy. You don't want it too challenging. Exactly. So I think it's helpful to talk about some of the digital resources out there. Some are free and yep. some are paid. And they're not all perfect and they all have something to offer. Silver Sneakers on Demand is a big one. What I like about Silver Sneakers is it has cardio, flexibility, strength. What I don't like about it is that sometimes it's a little too easy for people. Um, it's so slow. It's slower than the, my classes. I'm usually doing my classes at 128 beats per minute, and maybe the level one classes at 126 beats per minute with the cardio. And Silver Sneakers, I find, is at 120, which is sure. kind of slow. It can be quite slow, but they're trying to reach a very large audience. Right. It's often that you may not get a lot of intensity or individualized needs met through Silver Sneakers, but it's a good starting place for some. Perfect, yes. And 360 it's it's ymca online and they have a lot of different options there uh, national institute on aging go for life has some some stuff it's a little outdated but it's better than nothing um, then daily dose pd has a lot if, for those with parkinson's disease i like to mention this resource it's like netflix for parkinson's they have voice and cognitive and hand exercises and meditation and wow. high interval and coordination training spiro 100 is like netflix for active aging they also have a lot of different types of training modalities from cognitively demanding exercises 
to cardiovascular to dance oriented ones. So both are, are great in their own regard. They are subscription based. Uh, I think anywhere from 20 to $30 per month, quite reasonable. And they also offer regressions and progressions. So being in a chair to being supported by a chair to standing. So there's a lot of options for people. Yeah, the YouTube one that you had on there, I just want to warn people a little bit because there's a lot of people out there on YouTube putting videos out that aren't really qualified, and you have to be careful. I mean, a model, oh, yeah, a absolutely. beautiful model doing exercise does not mean she's a trained personal trainer and is certified in knowing what she's doing and what she's putting out there. So you really have to be careful, especially active agers. You need right. to stick with a uh, accredited place company absolutely look if i knew i could just be an underwear model and be qualified i would have gone to college but i missed that <laughs> um, but yes youtube you got to be cautious it's it's definitely a double-edged sword some people can find a lot of great stuff there but you do have to be cautious absolutely in terms of apps if you're game for those mindmate is one of the most downloaded apps among senior citizens ever it has brain games uh, recipes, some exercise stuff. There's a Tai Chi for seniors app or seven minute Chi, which is another Tai Chi one. Clock yourself is a great form of exercise that actually cognifies multi-directional stepping patterns. It's created by an Australian physiotherapist that combines cognitive with stepping and balance exercises. Really good yeah, platform. I use that in my classes. It's a great one. Wise Fit is another one. Uh, it's wise with a Y, not with an I, and then yoga for seniors. So those are all free, low-cost resources that are available digitally right now. And so right. I often find that some people are just over-reliant on their trainer if they have one or group classes, and that's all they do. But we are in the age of self-efficacy, where we can actually understand what is what is needed of us if our goal is brain health, collect the resources with our you know, community-based fitness and, and movement professionals just being a part of that and actually take responsibility in putting together our own program with an emphasis and a recommendation of consulting with your doctor, consulting with those movement and fitness experts to, to guide you. But what I'm seeing is more people, instead of being reliant on classes and only doing that, more people are, are collecting these digital resources, putting together their own plan being more active physically and cognitively than ever. And that's a great place to be if you so wish to go there. Right. So that was a wealth of information, a lot of information. And I encourage my clients as well to do apps and <clears throat> go online in between. My classes are three days a week for, for most of the seniors or two days a week for the lower levels. And it's very important that they do things on their own and they do brain games as well. So, um, yeah, they combine it with exercise classes and doing some stuff on the own. That's right. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, staying cognitively stimulated is extremely important. Um, I know there's a lot of colleges or lifelong learning programs that people love to take advantage of. That's called cognitive stimulation. And then there's cognitive training, things like brain game apps, like Brain HQ, which is the most uh, evidence-based one to date. Um, and, of course, there's apps like Clock Yourself, like we mentioned, that actually combine to the two together. Right. And if it's important not to overthink the combined cognitive physical training. And I find that most people just need to engage in a skill-based modality where they're learning constantly. Um, both are valuable, of course. Right. But I think the point at which people overthink this, uh, you want to consider all the variables. It's a lot of information, but being anxious about accomplishing everything and checking off all the boxes sometimes yeah. is productive. Yeah, you don't want to be going overboard and stressing out about it. Well, yes. our time is, is running out, but I want to really thank you, Ryan, for joining me today and giving us such a wealth of information on um, brain and exercise, because I certainly promote exercising, not just for your brain, but for your body. Um, and I'm really happy that you expressed it in such a way, not just scientifically, but how to bring it down to the everyday person and how they can incorporate it into their their lives and how much of a difference it will make for them. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And thanks for all that you do. All right. And everybody, thank you for watching today. And I'd like to say I'll see you next time on Get Healthy with Holly.